is, could you please comment on osteoporosis and a plant-based diet? Ah, uh, yes. I, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, so the question is, is, is um, comment on osteoporosis and a plant-based diet. Right. Uh, that's usually uh, researched in the context of uh, calcium, protein, and a few other things as far as the diet is concerned. And what we do know, I think with a great deal of confidence, and this is a publication that first appeared uh, by the late Professor Mark Hanks at Harvard some years ago, 30 years ago now, showing that the higher the calcium intake, the higher the uh, rates of osteoporosis, calcium coming from animal foods in this case, especially dairy food. Uh, then later there was a publication from Yale showing the higher the consumption of animal protein, the higher the osteoporosis rates, measured as bone fracture rate, of course. That, that goes on the animal side, the animal-based food side, um, which suggested that plant-based foods are better. And so there were, I still recall some data showing that vitamin K uh, and, and, and some other constituents of plant-based foods tend to protect against you know, the, the onset of osteoporosis. Then there were some, uh, there's been some studies done at the University of California, Berkeley over the years, by a group by the, uh, the headed up by uh, uh, Dr. Sebastian. And he really had some really interesting data showing that if, if he looked at the, ra the ratio of plant to animal food, really, really impressive graphs, of which I have them here to show. But he showed the greater the consumption, or the greater the ratio of plant-based food, plant protein especially, indica indicative of plant-based foods. The greater the rate, the ratio of plant-based foods, the the uh, lower was the yeah the yeah, lower, lower was the the fracture, yeah, rate. the fracture rate. Very impressive. In fact, I, of all the data I know on this subject, I think that's probably the most impressive I've seen. Yeah, I mean that was one that was an, among a fairly large group of women in California over right. about eight years or so. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and and the, and the line itself for those statisticians among those watching. The, the line was just almost like a perfect fit line. It was skewed so yeah. that, you know, there, one, as one approaches a, a whole plant-based food diet, then the reduction in the risk really was escalated quite rapidly. Quite, a, quite interesting. I will also make a plug for exercise with regard to bone health. Um, exercise is clearly, clearly uh, protective of your bones, so exercise should be part of a healthy lifestyle. Weight bearing exercise. Weight bearing, but that includes even like going out and walking. And, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. We had a great uh, feature in our newsletter too on that. They yes. can go back to our website and check out some of the articles. Yes, we recently had a, a nice uh, newsletter about oste about dairy intake, um, and of course that related to uh, bone health. Mm -hmm. So yeah. take a look on our website. Yeah. The next question is from Amy. What does Dr. Campbell think of the paleo diet for people who have autoimmune issues? So the question is, what do, what does, uh, what do we think of, um, which Dr. Campbell? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Pick a Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> so it does, what, what Dr. Campbell, uh, does which, whichever one Dr. Campbell think of the uh, paleo diet for autoimmune issues? Any uh, leaps? I, so well, we don't I, I, let me make one comment, there's a specific study for rheumatoid arthritis that was a vegan, uh, gluten-free diet that showed a beneficial um, effect on symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, and the uh, paleo and sort of gluten-free people touted the, the research as showing that gluten was bad, and the vegan people touted it, that, that it was a, a vegan effect. <laughs> but um, uh, basically, there's some, there's some evidence clearly that... Uh, um, you know, there are some of these factors that do benefit um, uh, autoimmune disease. It's limited, um, but you're, you asked specifically about the paleo diet. And, uh, you know, the paleo diet, if, if you look at Sir, Dr. Lauren Cordain's research, sort of the, the scientist that's actually published extensively about this uh, in the past 10, 15 years, the paleo diet, as described, includes about 50% uh, of your overall total calories as un unrefined, start un non-starchy uh, plant-based foods. No beans, no grains, um, non-starchy, non no tubers. So um, uh, 
actually I can't remember tubers, but the, but no grains, no beans. And uh, when you have 50%, so if you're consuming 1,000 calories a day of non-starchy fruits and vegetables, you are eating bucket loads of fruits and vegetables. Now, that sort of theoretical paleo diet is, is interesting, and if you study it to that extreme, is, is, uh, it may actually have some significant health benefits compared to the standard American diet, which is terrible. But if you um, look at most people following the paleo diet, they're not eating bucketfuls of fresh fruits and vegetables. It's meat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with lots of fat, and oddly, most of the paleo recipes and stuff have, have plenty of added uh, oil. So oil, olive oil is clearly not paleo, but that's one thing that sort of squeaked through. And um, the, the paleo diet in practice is very, very different from some of the theoretical paleo diets that have been proposed and perhaps some of the benefits that come with them. So I'm not familiar with the paleo diet being particularly beneficial for um, uh, autoimmune disease. I know that some of the gluten-free and maybe perhaps some of the grains have been have been related to autoimmune disease, but the paleo diet as practiced traditionally is not, uh, from what I'm aware, linked to improvements in autoimmune disease. Yeah, the paleo diet tends to lean toward a low-carb diet, to be honest right. about it. And you're quite right. Uh, in practice, people who actually follow the so-called paleo diet uh, they do have plates full of uh, all kinds of uh, animal-based foods, and I think that's really the objective of uh, Dr. Cordain. He does favor, in fact, a high-protein, high-fat diet. He sees nothing wrong with it. Uh, I know him and, and uh, talked to him about this kind of thing. Um, and so, you, you, on the autoimmune side of the equation, by the way, I think that was part of this yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. On that autoimmune uh, relationship, uh, with the paleo diet, as the question was put, um, the, the, the paleo diet is practiced as a high protein, high fat diet. Um, it doesn't contain dairy, of course, by the way. Right. Um, and uh, that tends to bias in favor of a higher risk for rheumatoid arthritis, as you just said. Um, and, uh, you mean what well, you mean the dairy leads no, no. to a higher risk, or you mean? No, the paleo diet, high in animal protein, high in oh, animal based oh, oh. foods tends to be associated with a higher risk for rheumatoid arthritis, for um, multiple sclerosis, um, and for um, uh, type 1 diabetes. Well, now, that's, that, that's with... I, I know, I know, let me finish this for a second. There tends to be that relationship. With, but, dare, with dairy. Not, yeah, I, that's exactly yeah, what I was going yeah, to say. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, it's an animal-based diet, but it tends to be focused on the contribution of uh, dairy to the animal-based yeah. mix. That's what I'm saying. And, and in the case of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, they often point out too, it's the vitamin D in the dairy that you know would be um, um, actually no, that's and the saturated fat. fat. Yeah, it's the saturated fat. Yeah, it's the saturated fat that tends to be consumed mostly from animal-based foods that has a. So I think you're implying that the, if there's benefits to the paleo, it might be because they're avoiding dairy. Are you, are you saying that? Are you uh, yeah, that? I think there's some possibility that has some of the effect. But on balance, there's a there's a study just came out here about a year or so ago, comparing a paleo diet. Uh, this was intervention like paleo diet with the standard American diet, which is already pretty high in protein and fat, as we know. Mm -hmm. And the paleo diet was still higher, more fat, more protein. They did this study, and in reality. Cholesterol is LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, total cholesterol, uh, actually was higher in the paleo diet compared to the standard American diet. Well, I, and, I, and uh, so, you know, the, the data, the, uh, that's the only study I know where there has been a direct comparison. comparison. Well, I've, I've, so, seen, I've seen some information that um, short-term studies of the paleo diet that um, there are actually some minor margin, some small improvements on weight and uh, HDL like active, cholesterol, like active, for example. Right. So it kind of depends on who's doing the study, but there's not a huge, this, there's not a huge consistent benefit. This was a six-month study, yeah. as I recall. Yeah. Six months. I mean, so. there are some very small studies showing some benefits, but um, can go both ways with it. Yeah.
All right. Well, here's another very popular topic. Caroline, uh, Nancy, and Wiesel all have questions about gluten and soy-free. So basically, is gluten-free recommended for everyone? Carolyn wants to know. Nancy said, what's your opinion of the gluten-free craze? And it's today's uh, gluten unhealthy. And another, how crucial is it to go gluten-free and soy-free in a plant-based diet? So, and I'd like you to mention your book and other things that we have yeah, about, you know. Actually, I'll make the comment, first comment, actually, Tom, you did a nice review yeah. you know, on the uh, gluten question. I, I think it was quite good in your new book, yeah. Cable Plan. So, yeah. fill us in. <laughs> so, uh, just to make sure everyone heard, the question was, how crucial is it that we avoid uh, gluten and soy? And the gluten issue is really such a hot topic, and I um, uh, hear about it a lot. I, I in my... My the short answer of this is that there's probably m many more people that are worried about gluten than than there needs to be. Um, it's kind of a trend that is, uh, uh, you know, if you put gluten-free labeling on a bag of potato chips, they sell more than the potato chips that don't have gluten-free labeling. Um, it's it's just an exploding trend right now, and I think it's probably overdone. That being said. Um, celiac disease is, is an absolutely real, uh, quite devastating um, illness that affects about 1% of the population, which leads to a, you know, a fairly large number of absolute people, but um, it's still a fairly small proportion of the population. Those people must avoid all gluten from wheat, barley, or rye quite religiously, and sometimes oats uh, can, can be reactive as well. Um, the main thing that most people are concerned about is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And that's where you may have been tested for celiac, you clearly don't have celiac, but you have a variety of vague uh, symptoms. That includes um, achy joints, you know, indigestion, uh, headaches, uh, foggy brain, uh, fatigue, that type of thing. And um, I, there's no great prevalence data on how much of this exists. I mean, to, to, when you think about it, it's quite difficult to get that data, actually. You have to um, remove the effect of placebo from the experiment, which is very difficult. So one way that people do this, one, that some experiments have done this, is to give people muffins. Uh, they, everyone's on a gluten-free diet, and then, and then one group gets muffins that's made with gluten, and another group gets muffins that's made gluten-free. And, um, and then they switch them, and they, and they switch them up in different ways. And people record their symptoms, and if their symptoms correlate with the muffins that they happen to be consuming that were gluten, um, you know, the, 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 it's considered to be a, a positive reaction. So there have been studies like this, and, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a real thing. So there, there are people who um, do have an increase of symptoms, even when they don't know they're consuming gluten. They do have an increase in symptoms. How many of us is that? Uh, we don't know for sure. The number I've seen, which is not not a very precise number, is about five or six percent of the population. So, you know, one out of twenty people um, with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, one percent have celiac disease. So it's not insignificant, um, but it's clearly not. You know, it's it's one of the biggest trends. It's you know, one out of out of uh, two people probably dieting is probably trying to avoid gluten. Um, so for me, uh, those numbers are low enough and I think there's enough questions left. I still recommend in general for most people that they consume whole wheat products and uh, not that they necessarily go out of their way but that they don't try to avoid it. Being strictly gluten free is actually quite difficult. Um, so I focus more on a whole food plant-based diet and keeping that absolutely as easy as possible and I include whole wheat products in that. So I don't emphasize that people must avoid gluten. Um, the exception being, you know, people with celiac disease in their family because there's a genetic, you're at higher risk. Uh, there's other conditions that are related to celiac disease, uh, type 1 diabetes, for example. Um, so. You know, in general, for I don't recommend you avoid uh, gluten. Um, you know, and then do you, and then the soy thing. I'll just say very quickly. I don't recommend people avoid soy um, 
either, actually, because uh, you know, recent evidence, for example, in breast cancer has shown that the more soy products women consume, the better the outcomes uh, are in breast cancer in several observational studies. That's in, that's in women who had diagnosed breast cancer as well as primary prevention of breast cancer. So, uh, and, and it's been shown for men, for example, soy has no effect on, on uh, uh, fertility, male hormones. Has, it, this idea of phytoestrogens in soy is not nutritionally important. Uh, there's a lot of good things in soy. I will say, try to eat edamame or whole soybeans. If you're eating a lot of the fake soy meats and soy products, you can run into problems. So, you know, the refined soy foods, uh, like any refined foods, you got to watch a little more carefully. Yeah, I'm just add another comment. It's my sense that this uh, re this rather uh, dramatic increase in interest in gluten-free products in the last what four or five years, I think. Um, actually has been uh, fostered by the publication of a couple of books right. uh, that uh, by people who happen to be, and I don't think it's coincidental, they really are opposed to the, the whole idea of a whole food plant-based diet. And then, so they pick on wheat in this particular case, in particular, and, and other gluten containing uh, cereal grains. And uh, they've made a big issue about it. Uh, the books are sold quite well. And uh, so the increase in gluten-free products or cereal products has just risen accordingly. Yeah. And so I, I, I think there's another agenda here. Well, there's a kernel reason. of truth to it, like I mentioned. There's, yeah, there, there's, there's absolutely there's a, a kernel, kernel of, truth. of truth. But then to, to take that and go to a low-carbohydrate diet that's, that's is, is outrageous. And that, unfortunately, that's what people end up doing. And that's what they intended for people to do. Right. right? That's the, the that's the recommendations. It's goofy.